Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Pastor Keon Henderson, and uh, I give leadership to the Lighthouse Church here in Houston, Texas. And what a privilege, what an honor, and what a joy it is uh, to have on here with me a good friend, um, an accomplished man, um, and the city as uh, mayor of the third, fourth largest city in the United States of America, and what I like to refer to uh, as one of the most powerful African American men in our nation. Uh, as at least at least as it relates to uh, being a mayor, uh, he's the black mayor of the uh, fourth largest city uh, in the United States of America. And so I'd like to welcome uh, to this platform and to your attention, Pastor. I call him Pastor. <laughs> he's, a great, he's a great order, a great speaker, uh, a great leader, uh, Mayor Sylvester Turner. How are you, sir? I'm doing fine, Pastor. Thanks for that promotion, man. Uh, Listen, it's, it's, it's the church and the leadership and the city of Houston, Texas, uh, it is an honor to have you right now. And I know that your time is valuable and I won't uh, hold you long because while you and I have just stepped away from our duties just for a moment to get on the computer, uh, people in Philadelphia and people in Los Angeles, uh, people in um, uh, Miami, Fort Lauderdale, even Fort Wayne, Indiana, small town where I played basketball. People all over the country are upset, obviously, over the uh, videotaped killing of, uh, of Mr. Floyd. And um, uh, I wanted to talk to you today because I believe that everybody has their, uh, their ingredient that they put in the recipe. And some are marchers and some uh, are prolific at that and some uh, right. get bored and they're prolific at that. Some have platforms and they're prolific at that. And you are our leader in this moment of unrest. And so at least with the people I have influence with, I wanted to allow you to address us, uh, to answer some questions and to also um, help us to devise a plan uh, going forward. So that, that's what we're here for today. And I want to thank you for your time. Well, thank you, Pastor Keon. And let me tell you, it takes all of us to, to make it work. Um, you know, these are, these are challenging times. It was, uh, it was challenging before the death of George Floyd, uh, a Houston native, you know, grew up in this city. It was challenging before, it's even more challenging now. So, but, so it's gonna take all of us working collectively uh, to address uh, the ills within our society um, in order to move forward uh, in a constructive, in a constructive fashion. Let me just say, look, you know, like so, like millions of people around the globe, you know, saw the, um, uh, saw the video, uh, it speaks for itself. Um, you know, here's a law enforcement officer uh, who was taking the oath to uphold and protect, defend uh, with, um, with his knee on George's neck for nine minutes uh, until life was no longer within his body. Uh, and then three other, you know, law enforcement officers that were standing around, not intervening. Um, I called them enablers. Uh, and so it was hard to watch. It was it's just hard to watch. So there's a great deal of pain all throughout our, our, our country, a great deal of pain. Emotions are raw. People are frustrated. People are angry, rightfully so. People are marching, demonstrating, protesting, rightfully so. And quite frankly, I join, I join with them. And so uh, it, it, it need, that means that there needs to be uh, an internal review, uh, systematic changes. Uh, we have to do things better, uh, engage in best practices, training. So there are a number of things that we need to do in order to move, to move forward. Well, you know, this, this young generation um, gets a lot of their information from social media. I, I've got nieces and nephews that are young and I'll watch the news and, and they'll know about it, but they would have found out about it on the Shade Room or uh, some social yeah. media platform. And yeah. I saw a meme, I'm looking at it right now, and uh, it says, I'm convinced that the government hired 2020. And, and when I looked at that, because of all of the things that are going on with COVID-19, um, and, and I think that people are upset, I think that Floyd's death uh, was the straw that broke the camel's back. But what I think really has contributed to this unrest is that there are, over the last 30 days, three consecutive instances, uh, whether it be uh, Ahmad jogging there in Georgia or the young lady in her home uh, in, uh, there in Kentucky. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and then here. So uh, just a real quick story. I, I cut my, my pinky finger the other day with my daughter. We were out washing the car and I cut it and I cut it pretty bad. And now I notice that every time I hit something, uh, it's, it's sore and it hurts. And I didn't recognize, I mean, just normal stuff, washing my hands, taking a shower, brushing my teeth. And, and now I realize that the reason why I feel it so much is because I have an open wound. And I think that this open wound uh, that has taken place in our society is the reason we see the unrest. It's the reason why we see people turning over cars. And, and I do not advocate a violence of any nature. I do not advocate a looting of any nature. But I do think that the men and women of our country are out in the street for a reason. And Mr. Mayor, they're out there because, number one, um, the system's knee has been on our neck way before we saw George on a video, uh, Mr. Floyd. Um, we uh, are disparaged when it comes to health care. We, uh, we are paid less uh, in certain places for the same job as our white counterparts. Um, when it comes to loans, um, we have to pay more for the money. Um, we can't get small business loans to start our businesses while they're still yelling at us, telling us to get a job. We live in communities, Mr. Mayor, where even here in the city of Houston, no fault of your own because you inherited this, but we live in cities where people don't even have grocery stores in their neighborhoods. We call them food deserts, as you know about that. And, um, um, you know, I was watching CNN and I saw one of the anchors, a black man arrested on camera while the white cameramen and the white counterparts got to walk free. What do you say as an African-American leader to the citizens of this city? What are you doing to ensure that even though we want this to be a global solution, it has to be done in parcels by all of the individual leaders and you are not responsible for what took place in Minneapolis. You don't lead there, but you lead here. What are some of the things that we're doing as a city and you as a leader to ensure that those things are, are, are rectified for our people in this city? And let me just say, uh, uh, Pastor Kim, uh, the womb has been open for a long, long, long time. And that over the decades, over the decades, uh, people even before me were fighting to close that womb, to address these systemic challenges and inequities that exist with, that have existed in our society for a long time. So the people before me were um, were fighting. Um, now, for example, um, it is my turn, and others who are living right along with me, I should say, our turn uh, to do everything we can to address um, those wounds and to close those to those inequities. Um, when I ran for office, for example, and became mayor of the city of Houston. I recognize that there were communities, even within the city of Houston, that have been underserved and under-resourced for decades. I, I grew up in one. I still live in that same community, which I was born in Rio. And, uh, and there are people in our cities uh, all across America that have been operating on the margins of life. But when I came in, I, I said we have to address it in a systemic way. And we have to put forth strategies, not just programs, but strategies in order to uplift these communities and to put people in a better position so that they can withstand the challenges that come. Because when they are facing uh, natural disasters or when they are facing things like a pandemic uh, crisis, virus, or when they are facing, for example, even this particular uh, injustice, uh, again, we have to equip them uh, with the tools that they need to combat these challenges, which means uh, from an educational system, we've got to provide quality education and enhance them. When it comes to housing, we have to provide them with affordable quality housing. When it comes to the healthcare delivery system, we have to make healthcare affordable and, and um, available uh, for them, quality healthcare. When it comes to economic opportunities, it's not just about providing people with a job, it's a job with living livable wages. But in addition to that, we also have to create that entrepreneurial spirit so that people can create businesses within their own respective communities and neighborhoods so that they can hire people within their neighborhoods, providing them with the workforce skills to take advantage of the opportunities that are coming about in our cities uh, each and every day. When it comes to eliminating the digital divide, 
because a lot of jobs now focus on innovation, startups, technology. And if there's a digital divide, then they're not, they're going to be left off, off of that highway. Those things are important. Infrastructure, because oftentimes, for example, the infrastructure in these communities and neighborhoods are under par. All of these are ills that lead to and exacerbate a situation like George Floyd. So the, the wound, I agree, didn't just happen overnight. And the question now becomes, how do we systematically address it so that we can improve people's quality of life, their, their economic financial opportunities, so such that we can put people in a better place, that they can take care of themselves and their families and move forward, regardless of who may be in office. Those are the things that we, that we are dealing with uh, here in the city of Houston and in my administration. And I've said to my own executive team, we don't have a, a lot of time to get these things done, even though uh, it didn't start on my watch. The reality is I'm now on the wall now myself. So the responsibility now falls on me, my team, and making sure that we uh, work with others in order to address the situation. We can't afford to be what I call incrementalists, because if you're an incrementalist, nobody sees the little bit that you have done. We have to be transformative, and we have to move with a great deal of urgency. Yeah, I was listening uh, to the news today, and the, the mayor of St. Paul uh, said it this way. He said, we're not asking our citizens uh, for patience, but we are asking them for peace. Uh, I right. think that it is extremely important that it be imperative that uh, we know that time is of the essence and, and to have these things put in place so that way they can outlive and outlast administration. And the only way to do that is to make it law, to make it, uh, to make it credence, because if it is not law, then it is subject to the person in power. And, and I think that that's what's frustrating. As a young African-American man, Mr. Mayor, I know exactly what it feels like to be driving in the car. I never will forget. I've only gotten one speed, speeding ticket uh, while I have ever lived in the uh, state of Texas. And I was driving in Dallas up 45, and I did not know it was a law at the time. This was about 10 years ago. I did not know that if you were driving the speed limit and the officer was on the shoulder that you either had to get over or slow down by 20 miles per hour. I had no idea. But when those sirens went off and he came up behind me, the anxiety went through my body. And I am a law-abiding citizen. I pay my taxes. I've never been arrested. Um, I've not had any run-ins with the police in that regard. And I was afraid. When I am faced with a judicial system where a judge can put me in jail for smoking the same weed that he smokes. This is what young people are saying to me. When I grow up in a system um, where, where we're over incarcerated and, um, you know, if you watch it on TV now, you, you got Mr. George uh, Floyd, whose knee, their knee was on his neck. But then you got the young man uh, who was the student there in Maryland, and they were on a six-state manhunt for him. And when they find him, here he is on the ground, sitting on his behind, shirtless, with an officer putting a bottle of water in his mouth. Those are the type of inequities that cause people in your generation and, and our generation to be upset. And then this is what they're saying to me. Mr. Mayor, they'll say, um, you know, we didn't have fathers growing up, which I didn't. We didn't have any leaders. Everybody's saying, where's the leader? Who's the leader? Where are the leaders? Who's the next Martin Luther King? Who's the leader? Who's the leader? And none of us know the answer to the question. But this is the truth, and I know this. If this generation is lost, then it is the incumbent responsibility of the previous generation because any generation that has been lost was lost by the generation that had it in its hands. How do we in Houston, Texas, and maybe we'll be a platform for other cities to mimic. How do we get into the system? And, and I think one thing needs to happen. Here's the, the more pertinent question. How do we break up the alliances between the district attorneys and the police departments? Because far too 
often we look around our cities and our states and we see people like the young man uh, who was killed by the older gentleman in, in, in Georgia, not prosecuted. And here it is, George Floyd was murdered immediately, but his killer was arrested eventually because the DA would, would, would refuse to uh, pursue the case. And they can get warrants whenever they want. So how do we assure our people that not only in Houston, but what can be done to break up this alliance between district attorneys and police departments? Because as a DA, you work for the district and not the police department. Right. But, but change doesn't come on its, on its own. Okay. Um, it, has to be, it has to be brought about. Well, regardless of the system, okay, the system is made up of people who are within the system and who drive the system. And when you have people that are a part of the system, okay, then those people are imperfect beings who are there. But it is important to have the right people with the right mindset, with the right sensitivities, uh, sitting at the table of decision making. That's important. And, and now the question, okay, how do those people get there? They get there, in most cases, they run for office. And who put them there? It's the people who vote for them. Systemic change, systemic change, and it's not, it's not a, a a, a very difficult concept. Systemic change has always occurred from the, from the ballot box. And when people fail to respond once they are there, then you replace them. And you replace them with somebody else until they get the right, until you, you get the right message and you get people who are responsive to your needs. I applaud people, for example, who are demonstrating, who are marching, who are protesting because of what they saw in Minneapolis with George Floyd, and I joined with them. But George, there are George Floyds all over our country who have been um, 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 murdered, who are in jails and prisons, but haven't committed no crimes. And just like you said, who may have committed a crime, but their treatment is a lot more severe. Every single day, I don't care who we are as people of color, okay? Even as the mayor of the city of Houston, I have to deal with that myself, okay? I'm not immune because take away, for example, with the label or without the label, okay? I am still an African-American and I'm still an African-American male and I have to deal with it. And just because I'm mayor doesn't mean that I'm immune from racism or inequities that exist within our society. But I do know that in order to bring about the change that people seek and the change that they are deserving of, it takes place also, it takes place at the ballot box. Because who's sitting at the table is critically important. It's important. And so march, demonstrate, protest, and then show up when it comes time, for example, of changing people out and putting other people in who will be responsive uh, to the needs and the concerns of people within all communities and not just, and not just some. And, and so those are the people, whether they're DAs, whether they are mayors, whether they're representatives, those are the people in large, in, in, in large part who are driving, making up the policies, driving the policies, and then making the decision of who gets uh, prosecuted and who doesn't. Well, and let me, let me echo uh, what you're saying, especially to all of y'all who are watching this on YouTube right now. Um, it is important that you grasp the part of the message that the mayor just laid out. Uh, these changes are made at the ballot box and typically um, uh, you don't see a reaction in our communities, uh, ladies and gentlemen, because we have not yet figured out a way to become a consistent enough uh, ballot box uh, uh, um, institutionalized change agent for our cities. And it's not all your fault because I know that these, these laws, that if you're a felon, then you can't vote, which I think should change, but that's for another conversation. Um, there are a lot of things that uh, uh, Jerry uh, Mandering and rigging uh, the, the districts and all of those things that 
uh, the uh, electoral college. There are a lot of things that, that make it difficult, but those are on federal levels. Uh, black people who are watching, whites, whoever you are, you can't miss the local elections just focused on the national. There are, there are local elections that take place all of the time, some every two years, every four years, where you get to vote on city council members, where you get to vote on, on your uh, county commissioners, your sheriffs, your district attorneys, uh, your congressional leaders. If we would vote the way we should, uh, those of us who are able to, then we could come about and make some change. And I am with you on, uh, you can't complain about a thing that you won't show up for. And, and many of us won't show up for our own deliverance. And that is one power that has been fought for, that has been underutilized. Um, and uh, I agree with you wholeheartedly on that. Um, I think also... But, but let me just say, again, I still want people, it's still important for people to march, to demonstrate, to protest. Those are effective tools. Those are effective tools. The only point that I'm saying, it just can't stop there. It can't stop there. That same energy, the same things that are motivating people to come out during the day and, in, and at night to stand up in the face of the powers that be and say, we want to be, not only do we want to be heard, we want you to respond. And we are tired of waiting, okay? We're tired of waiting. We want the changes to come yesterday. We're tired of false promises. You know, all of that is, is, is needed. And I, and I love the energy and I love what, what I'm seeing. So the only part that I, that I have an issue with, when people start to destroy, okay, start to destroy their own neighborhoods and stuff. That's why I have an issue. But you can't just stop there. You got to go to the next step. And that is for people who are not responsive, for people who are being insensitive, for people who, in the face of what they're seeing, a George Floyd, a foot uh, on the, uh, the knee on the neck, other people standing around, not doing anything, um, maybe the DA not moving too quickly. The ballot box is where those changes need to occur. And that same energy, that same energy that I have seen, for example, over the last six days, that same energy has to carry over to November and in the elections to come. The, what, where we have, um, you know, so we can't stop and start is what is the point that I'm, that I'm making, okay? It is systemic. It is an ongoing effort. It is not microwave. It is not where you show up today and then people do things tomorrow and then it's done. You, you have to stay in it for the long haul. And you yeah. have to continue I to force it. the The only power that can destroy something that's systemic is something that's sustainable. Um, nice. it, it has to be kept up um, and it has to be done. And, and I love the idea of the ballot box. Now, we all need to get there. I, I, I have supported um, um, all of our local um, uh, officials who are in office and those who are running. You know that uh, our church has been on the front lines of making sure that we've given sure. Uh, people the opportunity to state their case, whether Democratic, Republican, uh, liberal, conservative. We've, we've tried to be balanced uh, because we believe that uh, both sides of the aisle have great ideals uh, that can contribute uh, to, uh, to the welfare of our society. I, um, I also wanted to know, um, as the mayor of the city of Houston, I have personally been to many of the precincts um, I've done graduating classes for our police. I have, um, I've done uh, ride-alongs. Uh, my first ride-along was actually at a murder scene, and you know this, where a man had been shot in the head. Right. Um, I've been out there, and a lot of people don't see that, and they assume that some of us are not doing anything because we don't post everything on social media. Um, right. uh, I've, I've been... I've taught diversity training for the police department. We've done all of that. And yet it seems we keep finding ourselves here. So, so Mr. Mayor, we've done diversity training. We, we, we do sensitivity training. We, we do diverse, we do all of that kind of stuff. Is there anything you can tell us? Is there anything else that can be done? Uh, uh, like I tell our young people, you get to the scene of a crime, 
are, are you the victim of that? And, and the police uh, seem to be treating you unfairly. You can ask for a supervisor. I, I try to inform our people about those things. Is there anything else you can tell us other than the diversity training and sensitivity training and cultural training? Is there anything else we can do with our police departments so that they can see that, uh, not, not all of them, but as a whole, that, that they can see something else needs to be done. Well, let me just say that the police department in the city of Houston looks a lot different than the police department that existed 20, 25 years ago. Um, it is much more diverse. It represents, in large part, the diversity of our city. And we are one of the most diverse cities within the United States. So it's important, for example, to have African-Americans and Hispanics and Asians and Muslims, uh, 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 people of all sexual orientations within our police department. That diversity is critically important. And it's important for it not just to be at one level, but throughout every, every level, every position, every, every uh, office, for example. So at the top of the, the police department, for example, Chief Acevedo, you know, a Hispanic. Uh, on, as part of his executive command staff, you have Toy Fenner, uh, African-American, born in Riyadh, uh, right here in the city of Houston. And then the other person is Chief Slinker, Anglo. Uh, there. But throughout the entire department, you have to have that diversity up and down the ladder. The diversity training, critically important. And you constantly must train. It's not doing it one day or one week or one month and done. It has to be constant. And then you have to make sure that you're training in, in many different areas. Because right now, for example, uh, in, the, in the midst of the coronavirus, you have a lot of people who are stressed, dealing with anxieties, you have a lot of uh, domestic violence, you have uh, people who are engaged in, I mean, mental behavioral issues, substance abuse. So people are under a great deal of stress. And so our police officers, it's important for them to be trained so that they will know how to, how to, how to deal with that when they confront it on the, on the, uh, a person on the street. We constantly have to review our own internal procedures, policies, review actions, Personally, for example, uh, with regards to the uh, six, about six of the last four, five of the last uh, shootings, for example, involving police officers, I personally reviewed uh, the, that video because I wanted to see myself. Accountability becomes critically important. So there are a number of things from an internal point of view that we have to do to make sure that we are constantly improving and engaging in best practices. Now, with all of that being said, it doesn't mean that we're gonna get it right 100% of the time, but it is important for the public to know that we are not just assuming that every single thing that every police officer does is okay, okay? That we are constantly looking within our own organization and making sure that we are holding ourselves accountable and making sure that we are engaged in best practices and that we are listening to the people that we serve. Lastly, what I would say to you, Pastor Keon, it takes a whole lot to gain uh, the trust and the confidence of the public that we serve. It takes a whole lot. Uh, and once you gain it, you have to do everything you can to maintain it. And that's a constant, a constant sort of effort that you have to put forth. But we need the public, we need the community, is, is law enforcement and community working together, community and law enforcement working together. Both have to be on the, same, on the same team, moving in the same direction. But it is an everyday effort. And as long as people know that you're putting forth a good faith, genuine effort, okay, that you're putting forth a good faith, genuine effort, they don't expect perfection, but they do want to make sure that you are sensitive and that you're going to be responsive and that you're going to be accountable to every to things that are happening within your shop. And I think that that's, that's also uh, uh, an, an extremely uh, potent point with the caveat of understanding that people, we have to be upset at the system and not the individuals. Uh, our church uh, hosts the graduating class every year for the Houston Police Department. And, and there are some fine officers. HPD guards our church every, every Sunday and every Tuesday and every day. Uh, so this idea uh, that, that we get an opportunity to blanket an entire uh, group of people because of the actions of a few, I'm against that. And I wanna speak out on that because uh, you, you wouldn't um, have a bad experience with a doctor and say all doctors are bad or have 
a bad experience with one chef and say that all restaurants are bad. Uh, there is a there is an institutional issue uh, where we uh, globally, uh, nationwide, I should say, where where races are able to seek into our system, uh, and 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 a few bad apples make it bad for the whole bunch, and then they spoil the message. And so I'm in agreement with you uh, on that as well. I think the people are saying, um, you know, everybody's talking about. Uh, we need healing and healing, and and I, I believe we need healing. But I think that we we need solutions. We need solution. Um, and um, you know, I I I think two questions, and then we'll wrap it up. Number one, is there any concern uh, from a health standpoint where we have all these people who stayed in their house for for sixty five, seventy five, eighty five, ninety days, right? And in one day. In the thousands, everybody rushed out of the door after having sat still for three months, uh, and the virus didn't die with Mr. Floyd. Uh, mm -hmm. It's still alive. Are there any concerns of the transmission of COVID-19 with uh, the densities in these uh, heavily densified cities? And the, and, the, and the answer is yes, because what has happened is that this virus feeds on closeness. Um, and being in close proximity with, with one another. The virus is still here. Just on yesterday, I reported a number of cases within the city of Houston and an additional death. So the virus is present. What fuels the virus is when people come together and they don't engage in social distancing and they don't put on their face coverings and they don't engage in proper hygiene. And then what happens, you know, 40% of the people that you are around are asymptomatic. They are experiencing no symptoms. They look fine. They feel fine, but they are infectious and they are spreading it to other people. The other problem is that there's a two to three week lag period. So you may be around somebody today who is infectious and, and they have been in your midst and they've been breathing on you, coughing on you, or talking with you and nobody had on a face covering and you, and it won't show up for two to three weeks down the road. And before then, you've, you've also infected other people that were in your concentric circle as well. So, and the disproportional impact of this virus happens to be on people of color, yeah. African-Americans and Hispanics, and then people with underlying medical conditions, diabetes, uh, hypertension, uh, dialysis, okay? So, you know, the virus, didn't pause or take a break because we decided and that we people needed to march and demonstrate and protest. And so when people are doing that, they need to bear in mind that they still need to have their face coverings on and as best as possible, they still need to engage in social distancing. So yeah, there is, there's a concern that uh, in the month of June and as we move forward into this summer, uh, that there will be a, a spike in cases. I hope that won't be the case. But uh, I will tell you, uh, just last week, uh, we buried uh, one of my close friends and a special advisor to me, somebody that I went to college with, um, who died of COVID-19. So it is, it is very, it's very, very real. But what people need to understand, especially for people of color, is that this virus is having a disproportional impact on African-Americans and Hispanics. Last thing. Um... And I don't know if this is something you would consider. Minnesota is the place that Mr. Floyd left to go and change his life or to continue it. But he's a son of this soil. He's a son of this city. And while um, Minnesota has his body, Houston will own his grief. I was just on a call a few days ago with Van Jones and uh, Pastor Reverend Al Sharpton and Bishop T.D. Jakes and Angela Ryan, we, we had a discussion with several other leaders um, and we were all discussing this. And I thought to myself that I would ask you if it is all possible. Uh, I think Al Sharpton said that there'll be one funeral in Minnesota on a Thursday and then that weekend uh, his body will be laid to rest here. Is it any way possible in solidarity with our city, uh, with our country, with our nation, and for our people? Uh, is there any way to lower the flag uh, on the day of his burial? Um, in, in, uh, 
Uh, here, you can only lower the flag with the permission of your president and the governor. Mm -hmm. uh, so if, if one of them gives permission, we can, do, we, we can do that. As mayor of city of Houston, I don't have the unilateral authority to do that. But is we are going we to- seek that authority? If, I'm sorry? Is there a way that we can seek permission for that? Yeah, we can seek the permission from the, from the governor or the president and to the extent they grant it, then yes, it will happen. Um, the other thing though is that I've been in communication with the family. Uh, we, we are going to try for, to provide uh, them with, uh, with support as, they, as the body returns to the city of, city of Houston. Yeah, this is his home. Yeah, he went to, um, uh, to Minnesota, uh, but this is his home. This is where he was reared. Uh, he graduated from Jack Hicks High School. So this is, this is home. And we do want to do everything we can uh, to support the family. And at the same time, we want to do everything that we can to, uh, to provide him with a proper burial and then to continue uh, to engage in acts uh, that will um, prevent the situation uh, from happening to somebody else. So um, we're looking at different things that we can do uh, to be supportive and to, um, to give him a fitting uh, Houston uh, tribute. Well, Mr. Mayor, I want to tell you that I have always admired your leadership. Um, I know it's a difficult job. Uh, as a leader myself, none of us get it right all the time, but we do try to do it right every time. Um, and right. I know you to be uh, personally a man of integrity uh, and I know you to be a man that has tried to get it right. I know your love for this city. Uh, for those of y'all who watch this, who don't even live in the city of Houston. Um, it is important to know that our mayor lives in the city. And when I say in the city, I mean in the city. Uh, and so we thank you for your leadership. Um, um, we do uh, come to you today, uh, seemingly holding your feet to the fire, but I know you knew that when you took the oath of office. Uh, it is a sign of respect. Uh, we not only elected you once, we elected you twice. And that second go round showed you our immense amount of trust in you uh, as a leader, as the majority ruled. And so Godspeed with uh, what you have to do with all of this stuff that is going on. Um, and, um, you know, I say to you, um, you know, I'll be praying for you because that's what I can offer you as a friend and as a leader uh, in the city of Houston. Any final words that you would like to uh, say to those who are watching uh, before I give our closing remark? Well, number one, let me thank you. Let me thank you for, ha for having me and for those who are listening to us. Uh, look, we're all, in, we're all in this together. I tell everybody, you know, uh, uh, we can all do better. You know, I can do better. Uh, I'm the mayor of the city of Houston. And so uh, it's my responsibility on my watch to do everything we can to effectuate mean, meaningful, qualitative change. Uh, that's what people want. They want their lives to be improved, to be enhanced. Uh, whether these problems existed before I came here is, to me, is irrelevant. Uh, I'm here now, and it's my charge to do everything we can to make it better. But, I under, but what I also understand, it's going to take all of us working together in order to, and to bring about the change that, we, that people want to see and that I want to see. And I look forward, Pastor Keon, to working with you and many, 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 many others to make that happen. But leadership matters. Who's sitting at the table matters. All of those things matter. Uh, and we have to make sure that we follow all the way through to make, to have people at the table who are sensitive and who recognizes that there is strength and diversity. And it's not just about being diverse. It's about being diverse and inclusive as well. You don't want to, you can, uh, diverse is a descriptive term and you can be diverse, separate, segregated and apart. The question is, can we put forth a society where we are diverse and inclusive, where people have a seat at the table and can be a part of the policy making, can drive the decision making, and can make sure that our systems are responsive uh, to the people uh, who we are obligated to serve. That's my charge. And um, challenging, yes, but I tell you, I'd rather be on the court playing than on the bench observing. Well, listen, Mr. Mayor, thank you so much. And for those of y'all who are watching this, um, first of all, let me thank you for your time. And I know some of you all are upset and you are extremely angry. And you would have liked to see uh, probably a, a conversation uh, that didn't take place. I know that's a small minority. But what I will not do in these times where everything else is up against us, 
I would not create or produce something where you would see two African-American men going at each other. The mayor knows how I feel. We've had private conversations about change and all of our changes are not at the ballot box. He and I are now discussing ways uh, that we can get the foots and knees of, of, of the system off of us economically uh, um, and in healthcare and different ways. And we're gonna be sitting at some of those tables to bring you opportunities, whether it would be the job fair that I partnered with him uh, on last year with our, our Easter Expo. There are many of things that we're doing to make sure that the citizens of this city uh, have a fair shot. Also, I want you to know that we're not gonna leave you without a plan. In these next two or three minutes, I'm gonna leave you with a descriptive plan of how you can be a part of the solution and not just the problem. Number one, I want you to make sure that you personally are part of the healing of our nation. It is not the job of us to sit back and say they have to do it. They have a part, meaning the government, but we also have a part because it is a government of the people as well. Number two, I want you to know that you've got to make sure that you take part in electing elected officials. You can't let us elect them and then you critique them. You have to be a part of electing them. Number three, I want you to commit to a movement. And I have a personal place I'd like to send you. There is an organization called The Color of Change. And that organization has grown from 1,000 in 2011 in the days of Hurricane Katrina to over 4 million strong today. And if you want to be a part of that, you can text Floyd to 55156. You will receive a reply, and that will get you a part of what is going on in our nation. Again, you can text Floyd to 55156. Number four, know that there is not just a local fight. There is a federal fight. There is a federal fight. When you have elected officials who will say on national television, when they start looting, we start shooting which is language derived from the 60s, 67 and 68 to be specific, uh, that is intertwined with segregationist language, then you gotta understand we have a federal fight. And number five, number five, we've gotta make sure that we are a part of bringing economic justice to our communities. That is to suggest that you have to use your mind and God has given you the ability to create wealth, create those jobs, have the entrepreneurial spirit and be professional, be professional, have your paperwork together, keep your books, don't pay yourself out of just a transfer from checking to saving, but make sure you put yourself on a W-2 or a 1099 on the business so that it is professional and not a high paying hobby. Make sure that you're doing all of those things. And let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, believe me when I tell you, I know that there will be no justice if it's just us. And I'll leave you with this. In February of 1982, Audre Lorde delivered an address, and the name of the address was Learning from the 60s, as a part of her celebration of the Malcolm X weekend at Harvard University. And this is what she said, and I quote her. She says, I stand here now, black, lesbian, feminist, an inheritor of Malcolm X and his tradition doing my work and the ghost of his voice through my mouth i say to each and every one of you here tonight and this is me quoting her but challenging you revolution isn't a one-time event don't you give up don't you give in we can do this as a people god bless you and i hope this conversation helps to move it forward we'll see you at the top